And we are live. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, we're really excited to have you here to watch our live stream uh, of the fantastic Z9. A lot has been said about this camera, and we have, as always, our favorite friend from Nikon, Chris uh, Oganek. Um, and before I introduce Chris, for those who don't know Chris, and we get into our conversation, I just wanted to let everyone know. So number one, thanks to Nikon for uh, you know, sponsoring this and, and, and coming aboard to, to talk about the, the Z9. Uh, it's, it, it's a conversation that I've been looking forward to for a few weeks. Uh, and second to that, um, uh, I just want to say that this is an interactive experience like all of our live streams, so please ask your questions. Uh, they'll be moderated by my colleagues, um, and uh, we'll try to get to every single question. Uh, depending on the state and the flow, of everything, um, you know, we may push some of those questions to the end, uh, but uh, please ask those questions. Uh, and we have some of our staff as well, some of our sales staff online, and I think maybe even some folks from Nikon, maybe, because sometimes they do that, uh, to be able to answer your questions in that as well. So some questions we can't always answer, uh, so we've got our tech technical representatives uh, on the chat as well for you guys. So without further ado, Mr. Chris Aganek, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you so much. And it's not so much me that you actually want to be saying hello to. It's more the more the Z9. And I really know that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a pretty impressive. I mean, this year has been a big deal for for mirrorless cameras. Um, you know, we saw what happened with Sony A1 and Canon R3. And so you guys had big shoes to fill when you came out with this. And there's a lot of expectations about what this camera could be and should be from, you know, Nikon fans and just, you know, the pundits in general. Um, when you first got this camera in your hands and you heard about all the specs, uh, walk me through how you felt about uh, what you had in your hands. I was I was cautiously optimistic. Um, I, I saw all the specs, and on paper, you you see what it's meant to do. And and I'm I'm very very cautious, especially when I'm talking to to my boss, to my director, to the president of Nikon, and I'm trying to give them feedback as to what I think the camera is able to do so far, because they're always like, "Come on, Chris, what is it? How good is it?" And my first couple tests that I that I was doing with this camera against uh, a couple other uh, cameras in the market, and I didn't. I was let me put it this way: I was incredibly surprised at. Considering the fact that I was using a pre 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 production sample, yeah, at how far it was um, when comparing it against to, to other cameras that are that are currently out there, so I was kind of going, "Is it really this good?" I, I and then I was very cautious. I kept telling my boss, ah, "Just let me do one more test. Just let me do one more test. I just want to be sure that it really is this good. That the autofocus is that amazing. That the capability overall that we're." seeing in real life is as good as we're actually saying it should be. And the more tests I did, the more tests I did, the more tests I did, it just didn't fail. And everything that you guys are seeing from our ambassadors, whether it's from our launch preview, all of the information, I, like it's difficult to, to take my word for it because I'm obviously biased. I work for Nikon, but the tests that I show uh, online in our first look videos on our Nikon TV, that's all directly from camera. And a lot of what I, I've tried to show over the last little four or five days, whatever it's been since it launched, is direct um, ninja grabs from the actual screen to not just be like, yeah, here's one picture out of a sequence of a thousand and all of the other 999 were out of focus. It was, this is what is actually happening, what the camera is showing you, the confidence it gives the photographer. because. That's, I think, one big thing a lot of people are getting used to is having the camera not just be like, trust me, I got this, but actually showing the photographer what's going on at, at every single moment. And the Z9 does that uh, with all the subject detection capabilities. It's showing you multiple people in the frame. It's showing you eyes, faces, dogs, cats, birds, all at the same time. And you're able to tell it, okay, I want that eye. And it's able to do it, lock on, and track it anywhere throughout the frame. So I, I, I think, as you can tell, I'm a little bit excited about the camera. Um, I, I think that my my cautiousness at the beginning kind of really kind of gave way to, oh wow, this is this is really as good as we're saying, and I think hope uh, people agree with me when we launch it. And since the launch a couple of days ago, it's just been absolutely mm -hmm. bonkers. Uh, all the information that basically validates everything I've been seeing. It's uh, it's been really really good. And and so here's. <laughs> 
this is like, you know, personal observation here, but you know, every time a new camera comes out from whatever brand, we have this, there's the same sort of rhetoric. Like it's like, it's the best at this now, and this is the best at that now. And I mean, like that's just technology, right? Technology is just gonna keep getting better. Um, it, but th there's one thing that's always true regardless of what happens when a camera comes out, which is, you know, if you want a high megapixel count, then you have low speed. Right, you you, know, you want low megapixel count. You have high speed or high <clears throat> high sensitivity with the low megapixels. And there's always a trade-off, somehow. <clears throat> and you know we're getting better, and there's cameras that are getting higher megapixels and 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 still much better sensitivity. And as technology continues to improve, but what struck me in in viewers, you need to know that I've never touched this camera. Uh, they don't let me um, yet. Not yes. yet. I'm getting Eventually, I'll get Not one. Yet. Eventually, <laughs> but but just on the specs alone and the videos that I've watched. Um, it really seems like Nikon is the first company to create a camera that m some magic can do really high megapixel counts at really high continuous shooting with really good low light. Um, how is this possible, Chris? How have you guys broken it's... science? <laughs> Well, I think we, we started to see it a couple of years ago, even with the D850, even with the Z7, the Z7 II. They kind of walked that line of the image quality side of it was there in terms of the high ISO was still very good for those for that. So the speed was decent, um, but overall image quality was amazing. And kind of like you said, with the, the D850, when it came out, it was kind of an oh my God moment where you can have the dynamic range, you can still get great ISO and... The speed is decent. Now with the Z9, um, the thing that really kind of sets this apart in terms of the speed and overall capability is the processor. Um, people kind of overlook that a lot and just say, oh yeah, it's a stack sensor. And yes, that absolutely has a lot to do with it. But this is a new X-Speed 7 processor, which we came from dual X-Speed 6, which sounds impressive because there's two of them. This X-Speed 7 processor in the Z9 has 10 times the processing power of what a Z6 or Z7 II is capable of. Wow. So like, just think about that. One processor is 10 times more powerful than a dual processor we have in our Z7 II. So that's mm -hmm. just, it, it just shows how much is required to throw all this data from the sensor to the processor, everything in between. All the autofocus calculations that are happening 120 per second. Like there's so much going on and the camera's able to do it without breaking a sweat. Yeah. So, so I think, I think it's kind of been a slow culmination in overall technology, but then with a, the new processor, that's really what kind of uh, takes it all home. And like you said, it, it really is an absolutely do everything type of camera. Awesome. So we, let's go through. We're gonna we're gonna first talk about the major talking points of this camera, what your opinion of them, and then we've already got some questions that are coming in that I think addresses or, or, or speaks to some of these things. So let's first talk about autofocus. Um, because this is, you know, probably one of the big stories from this, uh, from this camera. Uh, and we have Tim Lays, uh, is asking, looking forward to hearing about the autofocus grid. Uh, does it fill the entire frame? Um, he feels that, um, uh, some other products might be, uh, more limited, you know, um, some of the Nikons he's felt that have not had a full frame, you know, uh, autofocus grid. So what are we, what are we talking about here? Give us a... a if you can answer that question and also talk a little bit about what's new in autofocus in, in this particular camera. Yep, uh, so I'll answer his question first. I'll answer his question with a visual, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, what I'll do is I'll actually just show my screen here. And this this is the a blacked out version of what, what the Z9 sees. So if I move this autofocus point all the way to the top, all the way to the bottom, all the way uh, to the left and right. So we have 90% coverage in the horizontal and vertical directions with this. So is it 100%? No. Um, this is actually the same coverage that you get from a Z5, a Z6, a Z7, a Z6, a Z7 II. And personally, um, I, I have a feeling he's most likely talking about DSLRs uh, in terms of maybe some of the Nikons that didn't have as wide autofocus coverage, because with a DSLR, you're usually relegated to the center of a, of a screen. So we do have on all of our mirrorless cameras a really, really wide uh, ability for the for the camera to essentially see anything in the frame. Um, particularly with this camera, I'd say what it really, what sets it apart in terms of 
anything else um, that we've ever been able to have is the amount of autofocus calculations along with the subject detection, the, the intelligent small, uh, subject detection that we have built into it. So uh, it's kind of bandied about a lot, deep learning. Uh, deep learning algorithms is kind of thrown around as a buzzword a lot of the times. But we use deep learning algorithms for this, um, for, for the Z9. And when I heard that, my, my first thought, to be totally honest, I did an internal presentation first and I went, yeah, okay, deep learning, guys, deep learning. But in using the camera, you really get a sense of, oh my God, this is not just marketing terms. This truly was designed from the ground up with brand new algorithms that can go and detect nine different subject types. So uh, people, dogs, cats, birds, and then we have vehicle detection as well. So planes, trains, motorbikes, bikes, and uh, planes. So those nine different subject types are, are impressive enough. No other camera can do all nine. Um, but more importantly, it's the Z9 can do all nine at the same time. So every other camera on the market, you have to switch it. You, you the photographer, have to tell it, I'm taking a picture of a human. I'm taking a picture of a bird. I'm taking a picture of a, a car. And tell the camera what it is you want it to focus on. With the Z9, you just say, I want auto detection fully on, and it's able to jump back and forth between any subject matter that you put in the frame and it's able to do it completely by itself. So it's really, really powerful in terms of its intelligence, but you pair that with the stack CMOS sensor and the speed that it's able to essentially um, refresh itself, that it's able to scan itself every second, means you're able to get 120 autofocus calculations a second. That means if you're shooting at the, let's say 20 frames per second, so you're shooting raw 20 frames per second, in between frame one and frame two, your subject moves. Well, how much does it move? How erratic is it moving? Well, the Z9 can make five independent autofocus calculations and changes to that autofocus five times before it even takes that second photo. So there's a lot going on behind the scenes that it's not just, okay, yeah, good processor, but it's the subject detection, it's the speed of the sensor, everything that kind of goes together so harmoniously, as cheesy as that sounds, um, it really, really it takes takes the entire village to uh, to make this camera as good as it is. And uh, a couple of questions actually from the uh, chat here, respective to autofocus. Um, so one is, uh, Russ McPhee wants to know, how many select selectable autofocus points are there in this camera? So if you're going to, well, okay, so, so that's a different one, difficult one to answer, because if you're using single point, you have 493. Um, if you are going and using um, dynamic, ooh, because so so your autofocus point changes, right. right? Depending on which mode you're using. So we have dynamic, small, medium, and large. Then we have wide, small, a wide area, small, wide area, large, and then we have 3D tracking as well. So there's about 12 different answers I could give you. All I could tell you is that it's enough. <laughs> um, the the. The, and and I know I know that sounds like a like a, a I don't want to give you a real answer, but it's because between ninety percent coverage, the camera can see everything. And with let's say three D tracking, if I go back into um, my my camera here and I turn it to three uh, D tracking, you can see the size of that autofocus point. That's quite small so that's able and just so you know that's the starting size of the autofocus if i were to have that let's say on my face right and let's say that box took up my entire head if it recognized that i was a human and that uh, hopefully it would uh, and that that i have an eye the box will change from this size down to cover just my eye so so depending on the autofocus mode you're using it the, the size of the point actually changes so there's no real answer for him, and that's why my, my answer of it's enough is is truly it because the autofocus point changes as it needs depending on the subject that you're actually shooting and the AF mode that you're yeah. using. And uh, further to that, because I want to get into the 3D tracking too to explain to folks who might not know what that is, uh, but before we get into that, um, Ed wants to know if, if there's been any interesting improvements in terms of focus stacking over the Z6 II or the Z7 II. What can we talk about uh, focus stacking? Uh, so focus stacking is is a very very interesting um, technique that that people can that people can go and use with our cameras. We introduced it back uh, many years ago now. Uh, there's nothing really new about it per se. 
Uh, I'm just going to jump into the menu here. So we call it focus shift shooting. That's our kind of term for the automated version of what you will then go and use all those images together to create a focus stacked image. Um, so you essentially tell it the number of shots, you tell it the focus step width, that's how far you want it to change, going the, the focus to change, going from photo to photo to photo. If you're doing landscapes with it, you can use a very large focus step width because it can change a big degree and you'll still have overlapping depth of field. But if you're doing macro work, you would want something like a one or a two. Uh, you can go and tell it the interval until the next shot. Uh, the big one is you want the first frame exposure lock. I would usually have that as yes, which you can see I have it on uh, turned on. And then the even bigger one is the starting storage folder. Um, because you most likely when you're doing uh, focus stacking, you're going to be doing three, four, five, ten sequences. And to be able to parse between those, let's say, 400 images, which ones are from each sequence is a little bit tough. So you can actually go into starting um, storage folder and have it create a brand new folder every single time you start a new sequence. So there's nothing brand new uh, about the Z9, but um, some of the new lenses that have come out recently, like the new Macro Z uh, MC105 f2.8, that lens now lends itself really, really well to focus stacking with the uh, decreased amount of focus breathing that it has in comparison to the old version. So I would say in compare, uh, it, when you pair it with all the new Z lenses we have, um, it becomes much more, much more powerful. Uh, okay, so let's talk about 3D, 3D uh, uh, focus here. What, uh, explain to us what that is, because that was something that was ported over from the DSLRs, right? Yes, yes. Um, it, it's, it was my favorite mode back when I used to shoot DSLRs. Um, I'm being all nostalgic talking about sh back when I used to shoot DSLRs. Um, so with, with 3D tracking, one of the really, really impressive parts about it is back with the DSLR day, is you have the ability to tell the camera exactly where you want it to focus. So let's say um, you have a subject in the middle left part of the frame. So you'd be able to move the camera over there, focus, and then as either you move and recompose your shot or as the subject moves throughout the frame, the autofocus point would go and follow them, not just towards and away, because at the time, a lot of DSLRs, a lot of the other competitors had locked focus points. So you had to keep your composition exactly the same from the time you started focusing to the time you stopped. So this kind of gave you freedom to allow you to change your composition while shooting. So this was huge. One of the downsides with DSLR, as, as we kind of talked about before, is the, um, uh, the autofocus coverage area was quite small. Now, when you combine the subject detection capabilities, the nine different subjects, and the fact that we have 90% coverage across the entire frame, having 3D tracking in this camera is now really, really powerful because you have anywhere throughout the frame the camera can focus, you have the nine different subjects that, that it can focus on, and you as the photographer have the ability to initially tell the camera, this is what I want you to, to focus on. The thing that I, I think is the biggest um, uh, kind of comparison is if you're gonna use auto. Because a lot of people use auto area, especially on the current generation of mirrorless cameras. They're so good these days. But one thing lacking from auto is you don't have, as a photographer, the ability to always say, I want that green uh, water bottle to be my starting focus point. I want that tree. I want that person. I want that dog as what I want to initially have you focus on. Now with 3D tracking, you have the ability to tell it exactly where you want it to focus and then let it do its thing afterwards. Very cool. So let's now uh, talk about uh, kind of moving on to the, the processor speed and the power of, of this camera um, in sort of uh, going back to what I said earlier that usually there's a trade off somehow. But to see that this camera can shoot 45 megapixels uh, at 120 frames continuous. Um, I don't even know what to ask because it's just like it just <laughs> seems like it's made up. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I will say I will say so. That 120 frame per second still images. Yeah. The, the all, I will say that there is a bit of a trade off there. So you are not getting raw full 45 megapixel 14 bit images. You are getting JPEGs, yeah. and they are only uh, 11 megapixels. Okay. I say only 11 megapixels because I talk to people who are shooting with D3s, with D700s, and that's those are 12 megapixel cameras. Right. So there are people out there still shooting with with that level of kind of range of, of megapixels. And for some sports photographers who are on the sideline, 
they don't need that much. They only need like 3,000 pixels across and they're good. This is at like 42 or 4,300 wide. So yeah. so it, th there is a little bit of a trade-off, sure. um, but the overall capability of the camera to be able to focus the entire autofocus, uh, the, the entire 120 frame per second, it's, yeah. it's pretty unbelievable. So I think like that's the thing that I always try to communicate to people too when we're talking about the performance of certain cameras and, and what I feel is my job here at Viztech is to help viewers understand that like there is no one perfect camera, right? That is, you know, and what I do like about the Z9 though is that it tries to take, and I think it seems to do it very well, it tries to take a bunch of perfect cameras and meld them into one camera. So you don't need a photojournalism camera and then a landscape camera and so on and so forth. You've, ma you've managed to, to create a camera that kind of puts all these in it and you just select how you want to use it. So, you know, we, you know, we're in this megapixel race and we're in this speed race and everyone's like, I want as much megapixels as I can get as fast as I can get them. Um, but the reality is, is, you know, I know a couple of photojournalists full, full time, you know, working for major news agencies. They don't ever send raws ever because um, no one will accept them. Uh, they don't have time to send raws. Um, and most of not everything now ends up on the internet. And that's why we're talking about 11 megapixels being actually more than enough in this particular case, because what a photojournalist needs is to not miss a moment. And, exactly. and so, so that's the priority. And that's where I think that kind of comes in. Um, and then for those, like you said, who might be doing landscape or something like that, then they can take full advantage of all the megapixels. They don't need this rapid fire as much as, uh, you know, a photojournalist would. And then, so, so we have photojournalism on one side and then we have, you know, maybe uh, fine art or, um, or portraiture or things like that on, on the other side or landscape. But in the middle ground, there's this like wedding shooters, which they're kind of like photojournalists because they can't miss the moment, but they also need to be able to do large prints sometimes for people. They, you know, people make photo books uh, for their wedding. Uh, it's not just, you know, post my wedding photos to, to Instagram and, and be done with it. So how will this camera speak to wedding shooters who are in that middle ground that need that sort of high level performance, but also need the resolution? I think, and this is actually one of the things that I'm quite excited about because you, you hit really well on the, on the, the nail on the head with the, with the Z9 when you were kind of waxing eloquence about, about all the different types of users that it can touch is it has such amazing versatility and most Nikon flagship cameras, if you look at the, at the history of it, they have not been versatile products. They have been very niche. If you look at the D6, a D5, a D4, they were specific for a very narrow band of photographer and most photographers didn't need that specificness. And if they did, they only needed it for a very small percentage of their, of their job. So they would actually use like a D5 or a D6 as a companion camera, which is crazy to think about. But the Z9 really kind of takes that and, and, and turns it on a different way. And one of the ways that I'm really excited about it is when I hear about people, let's say event shooters, wedding photographers, they could be shooting two, three, four thousand shots in a single day, and they don't want to be stuck with a hundred megabyte files for every single one of those shots because your memory card is going to fill up, your hard drive is going to fill up, your computer is going to choke on them trying to edit them. So one of the, the cool things that I love about the Z9 is we have a new raw file type. And in the past, I, I've been able to kind of like I'll, I would guide people in a way that I felt was a really good balance of image quality with file size, because that's what I, I find it always is. Well, the way I would usually do that is to either recommend use raw medium, which is like a 24, 25 megapixel file type for like a Z72 or D850 or raw small. Or you could even go and downgrade from 14-bit to 12-bit. Well, what if I tell you that we've gotten rid of raw medium, we've gotten rid of raw small, and we've gotten rid of 12-bit. Oh, and we've gotten rid of uh, compressed uh, raw compression as well. So all these things that I used to use to help people get better file management, we've completely got rid of. But I promise you, I'm, uh, I'm not crazy. I'm not going to take us on some weird thing where I tell you that the uh, Z9 is... is garbage for this one use um we have three only raw options now so we have lossless compressed which this came directly from uh, previous cameras but we have two brand new ones we have high efficiency star and we have high efficiency now with all three of these options you're getting 14 bit so the highest possible uh, bit rate and you're getting 45 megapixels 
of quality. So your overall image quality never goes down. You do obviously lose file size though. So high efficiency star, you're losing about half the file size while still getting 14 bit at 45 megapixels and high efficiency, you're losing two thirds of the file size. So these two options right here for me are the answer for the wedding photographers. I would not recommend anybody like in the testing I've done and the testing I've seen Japan do, there is no reason to shoot lossless compressed and have a full huge file size, get half the file size and still have all your uh, dynamic range, still have all your megapixels and you literally have the best of both worlds. So this is kind of one of those cool things that I don't think, I don't think initially a lot of people were really excited about it because it kind of got hidden under the, under the rug by, 8k and 20 frames a second and oh my god amazing stack sensor but this is really one of those things that in the, somebody's everyday shooting workflow could actually make a really really big difference because it's saving them tons of file size while still giving them all that image quality and uh i want to sort of speak to that raw as well because we're going to talk about what's coming for this camera on the video side. We're going to get to video very shortly. I know we've already got a, a question or two regarding the video. Um, but one of the challenges and one of the benefits, one of the benefits that we've seen in the last couple of years in the video world is the uh, in, you know, invention or the release of ProRes RAW, which has got a lot of people really excited. Um, the downside to ProRes RAW is it's not a really a true RAW in the sense that it has a much greater dynamic range than a logarithmic file. Um, but you cannot change your, I mean, if you change your color temperature, it's just the same as changing your color temperature in a regular Kodak. Um, it's not, it's baked in basically. So there are some limitations with ProRes RAW. Um, when I look at these two versions of RAW, I'm not expecting you to necessarily know the answer to this, but when we're looking at going from lossless to high efficiency star, or high efficiency, is it a matter of it's like ProRes RAW in the sense that you captured a greater dynamic range, so you could, you know, if you've underexposed or overexposed, you've saved a lot of that footage, like in RAW, but maybe you've had to get your white balance a little bit more specifically, or is there more compression artifacts? What are some of the trade-offs uh, with going with something that's gonna save you on file sizes? So I would say the difference between lossless, okay, so, so uh, I'll answer your first question of, is it like ProRes RAW in that there are some downsides uh, to, let's say, something being baked in? The answer is no. Um, these are true RAW files. You can go and change anything in it, whether it's um, uh, your exposure, your white balance, even some of the really small details like active delighting. All of that is completely changeable. It is a, a non-baked in uh, file type. The downside, um, lossless compressed to high efficiency star. From everything I've seen, from, from everything Japan has 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 that I've seen from Japan in their testing, is there is no difference between them whatsoever. Is there more compression going on? Yes, that is that is what it is. It is a very high efficient, um, or it's a very efficient compression algorithm that we're using that we went and uh, and utilized for this feature. But in terms of uh, drawbacks, I am not seeing any now. The difference between high efficiency star and high efficiency. I've done a lot of tests and in my normal everyday kind of comparisons, I can't see a difference. Uh, Japan has told me that because there is obviously considerable compression going on to get it that small of a, of a file size, um, when you're, and the reason I'm laughing is because they, they said that at 400%, when you go and zoom in, so you're heavily pixel peeping, like beyond pixel peeping, and you're looking at very, very fine areas of detail, you may see some are, um, some compression artifacts around very high levels of detail at 400%. Yeah. I'm, I'm picky, but I'm not even that picky. So <laughs> so in, in everyday usage, I do not think you will be able to actually see a difference. It's like people saying 12-bit um, versus 14-bit. Well, you should, you should only ever shoot 14-bit because it's gonna give you the best. Well, yes, but if you're not a base ISO, you're not gonna see a difference. So I don't think that you're going to notice a difference between them. Uh, I personally, for the last little bit that I've had the camera, only been shooting in a high-efficiency star, just to kind of give myself that, that what if 
um, factor of I want to basically cover myself, have no artifacting uh, just in case, but I'm still getting half the file size of what, that I normally would. So that's kind of the route I've taken, the high efficiency star. But if I was going to go and shoot something tomorrow where I knew that I'd only be making very minor edits to it and I really wanted a small file size, let's say I'm doing sports outside, I have no problem going and shooting a high efficiency. You save that much file size, especially if I'm shooting 20, 30 frames, well, 20 frames per second all day long. Oh, yeah, I I'm, I'm, I'm have no problem with that. Uh, awesome. Uh, we've got a, a bunch of questions that have been flying in here, so I think I want to get to <laughs> yep. those before we move on to video. Um, and so we've got here uh, some Stephen Polvoy. And Stephen writes... Uh, oh, Stephen Paul, boy, I know oh, about fun. Hey, Stephen, how's it going? <laughs> so Stephen says, uh, Hey guys, I'm an amateur photographer and I do work at a children's camp during the summer using both my D850 and my D500 with great results. And then he poses this question to you, Why should I spend $7,000 to upgrade to a new enhanced Z9? Well, Stephen, knowing you, um, you are going to upgrade to the Z9 because you want the newest and the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why you upgraded to to the D850 when we came out with it. But um, in all in all honesty, it really comes down to everybody's usage. Not everybody like to be honest, DSLRs are still amazing. That's that's why we still have them in our lineup. That's why we're still making them. There there are still definitely benefits to DSLRs. And when you've been shooting, and and Stephen calls himself an amateur. He's he's a very very high level photographer doing amazing work with his cameras. So. He, he doesn't kind of give himself the, the, the justice that I know the skill that he has and the, the he's so used to DSLRs. And I think that's one of the big things that up until now, people who are shooting so heavily with DSLRs were a little bit hesitant because as good as the cameras were, a Z6 II, a Z7 II, if we're going to look at other brands, A7R Mark IV, uh, the Canon R5, R6, they're very, very good. But there's always a little bit of lag because it's an electronic viewfinder and you're not getting a direct feed from the sensor to the EVF. It's always kind of being uh, stolen information. I say stolen information from the single pipeline that goes from the sensor to the processor. And then the EVF steals data as it can. So there's always a little bit of, of, of lag. And when you're dealing with fast moving erratic subjects, that optical viewfinder for some people was the make it or break it uh, issue for them. Well, I would say for people who had an issue with mirrorless in the past, the Z9's EVF is something you have to try. It is so instantaneous. I won't bore you guys with all the dual stream technology, um, 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 techie stuff that I could get into, but basically we're, it's the only camera on the market that has a direct feed from the sensor, obviously to the processor, but from the sensor to the EVF as well. So we actually have dual pipelines of data going out, and this means that you are getting a direct feed to the EVF. That means black lag is really, really small. The ability of you to, to anticipate where your subject is, it's, it's almost like you're looking through an optical viewfinder. So I would say that if you're shooting with top of the line DSLRs, hey, they are still top of the line right now, but the Z9 is giving you added capabilities. It's giving you the ability to essentially shoot like you are with your DSLR through that EVF that feels like an optical viewfinder, but you have the subject detection, but you have the amazing video capabilities. All of that is kind of tied in. So you, you really aren't having to give up anything. Because I think if I talked to Stephen before, uh, two months ago, if I talked to him and I said, okay, buy a Z7 II. And he said, okay, well, give me the downsides. I could give him a couple downsides to going from his D850 to a Z7 II, considering the fast action that he always shoots. And now, if he asked me that, I don't think I'd have any downsides. So, so there's no real reason to go that you have to jump to a Z9. But for me, it's a, if you want all the benefits that mirrorless gives you without the negative aspects that if you really got really, really picky, that mirrorless did slightly have when you uh, shot particular subject matter, that's really where the Z9 shines. There, there really is no downside, no matter what it is you and, shoot. And it seems to me too, like you know, having basically there's zero blackout time. And that was if you're a DSLR shooter, you're like, I don't like blackout, so I want an optical viewfinder, right? And this sort of takes those excuses away. Um, and and I mean, I'm not 
yeah, I don't think I want to bore people with how the technology works in terms of, but you're, but it, it's a great point, right? It's always been like, you're right, it's stealing the information as it's getting written to the card. And, and so there's always been that problem. So I think that's really, when I saw that with the Z9, it's like, well, zero black, if you're, especially if you're a sports shooter, it's like, you know, that, why have a DSLR in my opinion? It's like, it makes no sense of, anymore as, as far as I can tell. Um, and that's not to say too, right? <laughs> that your DSLRs are still using the classic Nikon mount. And now with the, with the Z9, we have the ability to use the new glass, which is sharper edge to edge. So you have the optical, you know, from a lens perspective to be able to do that. Um, we've got some more questions here uh, from Wild Earth Cinematography. Can you please talk about the AF negative 8.5 EV uh, in brackets, the starlight mode, if, if any benefits to the night or astrophotography crowd? Ooh. Okay. So there's actually a couple things. I don't think I've ever actually brought this up um, on any of the, the stuff that I've done uh, so far. So we, we, we do have a couple things dedicated for, um, uh, for, for, for night shooters. One of them, and I'll, I'll get to the starlight mode in just a second. Uh, the first one I want to actually talk about is this, and it's warm display colors. Now, Dale, if I ask you what warm display colors means, what, what, what do you, what would your guess be? Well, my guess is that it's, 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 well, it's just like on a smartphone. It's like when you go to sleep at night, you don't want to be looking at a blue light. So you just switch it to like nighttime. Okay. Mode. It's like tungsten, tungsten balanced screen. So that is, that, that's what everybody thinks. That's what I thought. I was like, oh, warm display colors. What the heck? Why would we, well, it's nowhere near that at all. It's the complete opposite. Think when you're going to shoot a uh, nighttime, uh, let's say you're, you're, you're doing astro um, shooting all night. When you're out there and you're shooting, you're getting your settings, you're trying to find out where you are, your headlamp that you're using, you're not going and using, you, using like a white or a blue light. You're trying to go and use a red light so you don't go and kill your, your night yeah. vision. Well, that's what warm display colors is. So when you actually go in here and you'll actually see it when I go into mode one and two, you'll actually see go to that red. It, it's actually difficult to see the screen because it's it's gone so kind of black and pure dark red. But these modes are specifically designed to help you when you're shooting um, to not go and kill your your night vision. So you have mode one, which if I go and select this right now and I go and show you my incredibly, I don't know, uh, let's see if I dial that up. So this is my 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 bookshelf right here. You can see that everything is black and red. Um, the the view itself, all the icons, which in some instances would make it difficult to go and actually compose your scene. So. If we actually go and select mode two, you'll see that my book shelf is, so the, the scene you're looking at is fine, but your info, which is usually a really bright white, is still in that um, red and, uh, and black tone. So that's actually one cool thing that I don't think a lot of people are going to uh, know about is the warm display colors uh, as, a, as an option. So that's one thing. Uh, the other one is what he brought up. So that's starlight view. So starlight view, um, this does a couple things. One, it allows the camera to see in low light better. So we don't actually say how how it's being done, but it's a it's a slower autofocus acquisition. Uh, it's I, I would if I had to guess using more contrast detection because we use hybrid autofocus points that do contrast and phase detect. So I would guess that the phase detect is smaller and that the contrast detect is is bigger in, in, the, in the focus acquisition because contrast is better in low light. So it allows the camera to see in low light better, but it also amplifies the scene. So it's going to, if you wanna, if you're, if you picture yourself or somewhere up in the Rockies, and you can't really see much with your naked eye. If you go and turn Starlight View on, your exposure is automatically going to be kicked up about three stops. It, it varies a little bit, but let's say by three stops. So now you can actually go and see those stars much easier. You can see the outline of the trees on the tree line, so you can go and compose your shot easier. And it's not actually going to affect your end result. Your end result will still be um, how you set up your, your settings. But with starlight mode, it lets you see better. It lets the camera focus better. And it is... I, I did a comparison um, of, of that versus a Z7 II at night. And 
the Z7 II gets a little bit noisy, as do most cameras when you get into that pitch blackness. Um, the, the, they they kind of ramp up, most mirrorless cameras ramp up the, the EVF, and because of that, you get noise. The Z9 was clean, like scary clean, like really, really clean to the point that I was like, I don't know how we're doing this. And I, I asked one of our engineers and he just kind of looked at me and smiled. That's, that's the only answer that he would give me. Um, so it gives you a really clean view, which you're always going to get from the Z9, but it, it overexposes to let you see your surrounding and then it lets the camera focus in lower light as well. So that's fine with the warm uh, display colors. Uh, are two really nice things that uh, that definitely will help the astrophotographers. Uh, awesome, and uh, you know, astrophotographers also like to do time lapse, and uh, it's uh, quite uh, appropriate that we actually have a question on time lapse here uh, from uh, Nvidia. I, I'm gonna screw up this name, but I want to shout you out for the question nonetheless. Uh, Vidyadar. I hope I got that right. Probably not. Uh, but uh, he asks, he or she asks, uh, can we expect some features with, say, uh, oh, sorry, that's, he asked two questions. Uh, what is the limit to interval timer, if any? So is there any uh, time limits or any other type of limits imposed on your interval timer in, inside the camera? Yeah, so we have two different options. We have interval timer shooting, which is where you actually go and shoot your still images. Uh, that limit is 9,999 shots, so quite a long time. Um, then we have time-lapse video as another option. And time-lapse video is when you shoot, you tell the camera how many or how long to shoot for, and then it will go, go and create a movie for you in camera. So you kind of have the auto option of time-lapse video or the manual option where you have to do all the work um, afterwards imposed of interval timer. So interval timer is 9,999 and then an eight hour limit is what you get for the time-lapse video. So you can go and set it up to eight hours and then it'll, it'll go do its thing. And then the 9,999, that's up to you. Uh, you can have that spread out over a month, over a day. It's depending on your, on your interval. Can I say how impressive it is that you're able to find all these menu settings like so instantaneously? I don't know like what magic you're pulling on your end. You have an assistant there going, bring it up, bring it up. Um, uh, but speaking of which, uh, I love this. I, I don't recall. Is this a newly designed menu? Because I don't recall. Like I like the little buttons like where it shows like something's on and it gives you a little on. Good eye. Right? Yes. Uh, so th th talk to me about this new menu system. It looks sexy. It, it, to be totally honest, it, it does. So we've we've changed the font a little bit. We've moved a few things around. So like playback used to be at the very top. Now we've kind of thrown it down because you don't use playback all the time. You want to go and use your photo, your shoot video, and your custom settings more. So we've thrown that down. We have a brand new menu setting, network menu. So this is all for the network options. This is for your SnapBridge to your phone. This is for your FTP if you're a pro and you want to go and do that. But like you said, if you want to go and quickly toggle on and off a menu option, you don't have to go jumping into that menu because you used to have to go into it to turn it on or off. And sure, it's only one menu option that you're having to jump into, but now it's just a simple boom, on, off. So yeah, it's 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 small changes about the camera that are that are kind of really cool. Awesome. Uh, that is very cool. Uh, I'm always getting excited about menus because nothing frustrates me more than bad menus. So um, uh, so I want to move into video now because there's some exciting things that are happening in the video feed. Uh, let's, uh, I'm going to let you just talk about what we can expect uh, from this video and then we'll get into some questions about it. Well, I think it's easy to say. I'm not stretching the truth at all that the Z9 is our greatest video performing camera that we've ever had ever ever With, without a fraction of a doubt it just truly is and whether that's because of the frame rate whether that's because of the overall options there are so many things that the z9 is able to do and it's able to do it all by itself um you you, you talked about uh prores raw before well we we're able to do prores raw but only recording externally to a ninja uh we were able to do uh, so many other, let's say 10 bit, if you want a 10 bit or log, well, you would have to go external. But now with the, with the Z9, everything is done completely internally. So if you go to just frame rate wise, uh, we obviously have our, our 8K options. You can do 24 and 30. Then you have your 4K options, 24, 30, 60 and 120. But the cooler thing for me is the video file type options. So you have your H.265 8-bit, 
you have your H.265 10-bit, and then you have your standard, your uh, HLG, your N-Log, and then, now this only works for, um, uh, for 4K, but you have ProRes 422HQ 10-bit internally recorded. And you have the option of going whether you want standard or, or our N-Log. So all of these options are recording to our Type B CF Express cards. So you have no need to carry around a Blackmagic recorder, a Ninja. You don't need ad additional accessories. Yes, the body itself is a little bit larger style. It has the built-in grip, but we're giving you the ability to not have to take these other accessories and actually saving you space at the same time. Uh, the one challenge that I always find, and not to pick you in a, because we didn't talk about me asking you this question, and I don't know what's <laughs> gonna, what your answer is going to be, but one of the frustrations, of course, uh, for those who may not want to use an external recorder or use an external monitor is that most cameras, save for cameras like Panasonic, for example, most cameras don't really have good video um, uh, exposure tools. Like there's no waveform monitor, there's no focus, uh, or sorry, there's no uh, false color. Um, are we still looking at that for, the first, for a camera like this? Is it just histogram and zebras or have any other tools been added? We have added, um, we've expanded the use of Zebra. So now, so one of the things we, we've been asked about previously with other cameras was, well, yes, we want Zebra, but we also want to have different thresholds for it. We want to be able to, let, let's say, independently select the, the skin tones from just blowing out the, uh, the, the, the background overall. So we've, it, we've added that. Um, we've also had the ability to do focus peaking and zebra at the exact same time now which is always nice um with because i can't say too much but all i'll say is that yes we've talked about a free firmware that's going to allow 12-bit raw video a over 8k at 60p which is impressive but we are going to be doing some heavy other video firmware for the camera that does aim specifically at the higher end. Oh, amazing. So we, we will have to we will have to wait further on to, to get more info about that. But all I'll tell you is that I think you'll be impressed. I'm, I'm, I, it, you had me at 8K 60p. I was already I was already <laughs> impressed. Nothing more to say. End of video. Um, so it, on that level, um, I know that we've you know we, when you and I talked off channel, you said like there's no overheating issues. So how are we, in, and other cameras have not been so lucky uh, shooting 8K, um, how, uh, how has Nikon managed overheating with such uh, an, an impressive um, resolution and, and frame rate? What's, what's your experience? Um, it's, a, it's a number of things. So, so right off the bat, we've, we've taken away the 2959 limit, mm -hmm. and it's now a two hour and five limit. Um, is that, so that's, is that across that's all of frame rates and codecs, or is that just the 8K? Yep. Nope, that's that's anything. You can do 4K 120 for two hours and five minutes, assuming you have a large yeah. enough card sure. to, to be able to do it. Um, but yeah, there's there's no there's no limits to that two hour and five and, and five uh, time limit. And one of the impressive things is the is the heat management. Now, some of that is just due to the fact that it is a larger body, mm -hmm. so. If you have a bigger body, this is going to allow more heat dissipation just because of the added volume that uh, that is here. Um, but we did obviously take really, really good care when we designed the body. We uh, have, let's say, graphite in particular areas that allows better heat dissipation away from certain um, areas of the camera. We have full magnesium alloy chassis but it's been designed in a way and kind of you have particular materials overlapping that basically tries to get the heat away from the, the internals and kind of dissipates out near the, near the edges of the body. So there, it's, it's a kind of a combination of things. It's the fact that the body is large, so that is a benefit right off the bat, but we also just didn't leave it there and say, oh yeah, that'll be good for people, who cares? We tested the heck out of it and we made sure that the overall body design did actually help in the heat dissipation as well. And I've done a bunch of testing. I actually just came back from a, from a Vistex store uh, this morning. Uh, I picked up a couple cards to go and do some um, uh, some CF Express card testing with, and I recorded for an hour from the time I got into the car to the time I got home uh, in 8K just to see what 
how hot the card got, how hot the camera got, would it allow me to, was there any issues? And the answer was no. The card was a little warm to the touch when I when I took it out, but there was no problems with the actual camera itself. I basically got inside and started doing some stress testing of the buffer cycle. So in terms of heat, cap uh, heat issues, I, I would say there are none that I have seen um, so far. And I've, I've tried to push the camera pretty hard. Amazing. Uh, Dan Tardif has a question, uh, and I'm not. I'm just going to read it verbatim because I don't understand what he's talking about. So humor me on this one. Um, has the video delay been reduced when recording externally? So I'm assuming there's a. Oh. a that's like an HDMI delay kind of deal, or what's? what's... Yeah, I, I don't. Have, I don't have the exact number, but I would say it's at least uh, fifty percent uh, in terms of the the latency yeah. that uh, that has been decreased. Um, from uh, our other previous mirrorless cameras to the Z9. So yes, uh, significantly decreased. Great. And uh, Dan also did ask a question earlier on, just in terms of, um, you know, he says, can you out output all video frame, like frame rates to a Ninja V? Um, so uh, I think obviously 8K is going to be an issue, but if somebody did want to record externally, what's, what's the limit uh, that they can record externally to say an Atomos? To be honest, off the top of my head, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I know that as of I know that once we come out with um, uh, our raw options with the camera, as of what I know right now, uh, it will be internal only. I don't think we'll be exporting uh, raw to other recorders. I don't believe there's a limit. Uh, obviously, as you mentioned, 8K might be a, a, an issue for, for some recorders that just aren't compatible with it. But I don't think there's, there's if you do want to, I don't think there's a limit or, or a, uh, any reason why you yeah. couldn't go and export. Yeah. And just so you're aware, uh, not that you can see it, um, but I, when I'm plugging in and kind of showing you my, my uh, menus here, I'm plugging in through this HDMI cable. This is a full-size HDMI cable that goes into the, uh, into the camera. You're not looking at the micro or the, or the mini HDMI. It is a full-size HDMI that plugs directly into the camera. Amazing. Uh, that's always valuable. For years, we asked manufacturers <laughs> to do these things, and now in the last few years, they're finally doing it, thank God. Now I just need SDI somehow, some magic sort of SDI. I know, I know. I, I, yeah. I knew you would ask. Yeah. I knew you would ask. <laughs> I want there, it all, Chris. There might be. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, there's a, another question here. Uh, uh, Domagoj uh, Malovic asks, what about B-RAW internal recording? <laughs> Wouldn't that be your call? Cool? Well, that's another camera brand there, uh, Dom. Uh, so I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, that, that's yeah. A, that's a, I don't know. For for sure, we're gonna do ProRes RAW. Yeah. That will not be at 8K. Yeah. Uh, I do not believe it's gonna be our our N RAW only, yeah. uh, at least at the very beginning. And then B RAW, I haven't heard. Yeah. Um, I know that people are asking, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. we'll have to wait and see. Because that's the event. For those who don't know, B RAW is like. And re compared to ProRes RAW, it's actually a real RAW, like because you can swing your color temperature and all that sort of stuff, whereas ProRes you can't. So, um, so that's where I think the desire for folks coming and looking for a, a co nicely compressed uh, RAW. But it sounds to me like the N RAW is going to do the exact same thing. So, I don't see I don't see a desire or a need for B RAW, truthfully. Um, uh, now, with if people order this camera now and when they get it. They don't get raw right away, like the raw in photos, yes. But uh, to my understanding, uh, you know, like you said, this is uh, raw for video will come in 2022 at some point with potentially some other firmware uh, upgrades as well. Um, any other things that we can expect in firmware upgrades uh, across the whole camera in 2022? Is there anything else beyond that that raw capability? Yes. <laughs> it's all I need to know, Chris. It's all I need to know. Um, wonderful. Um, oh, we've got uh, one more, another question here. Um, so it's Tim again, Tim Lays. Tim says, I shoot on location with laptop. Uh, unlike the Z7, can you review images in camera while tethered? Um, and do the images get downloaded to the card that's in the camera at the same time as the computer? So again, tethering. Um, and can you, uh, you know, have it record internally while you're tethering? Um, and can you review images while you're tethering? Talk tethering. So, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll answer that in a couple ways. One, 
the limitation of not being able to review on camera is actually based on the the, the software that you're using. I'm assuming that he's going to use like a Lightroom or a Capture One. Uh, if you are using our Capture Control Pro 2 software, you actually can review on the camera while while actually shooting on the screen. So um, it, it does depend on the software. So that's a slight limitation. We are actually coming out with a uh, we're, we're coming out with a new type of tethering software that is free. It's called NX Tether. And it theoretically, I, I haven't gotten, been able to get my hands on one yet. Uh, it's going to be released in the next week or two for me. Um, and from what I understand, it will actually work hand in hand with other third party software. So Lightroom, Capture One. So I'm, in, I'm intrigued by that. I don't have a lot of info. I can't. I know that there are some limitations at first. Like you can either, I believe it's you can review on camera, but you don't necessarily see a live preview on the computer just right now for the initial launch of the of the software. So we're, we're essentially working our way with that. Um, but as for to answer your question, if you're using Lightroom or uh, Capture One, if you are looking for their dedicated tethering for the Z9, you're probably going to be waiting quite a bit. Um, generally, and this is me making a vast, vast generalization, uh, you usually have to wait six months, eight months, a year sometimes, depending on the software you're using before they actually come out with the tethering capability. They'll come out with the raw capability, but those are two very, very separate things. So um, yeah, I would say I don't know because I can't use tethering with the Z9 right now with any other software and you won't be either to, I won't be able to either uh, for quite a bit, I'm guessing. That's why I'm hoping that our new NX Tether does work as well with third parties as I'm hoping. And in that case, you would be able to essentially use, I'm hoping it works almost like a plugin. That's my, that's my hope. Um, I, that's, that's Chris, Chris, uh, Nikon hat is off right now. This is Chris talking because I don't have the information. So I'm hoping that the plugin, that it works such as a plugin for, let's say Lightroom that will enable you to use the Z9 right out of the gate. And we won't have to wait for Lightroom to come up with their own dedicated tethering option. It would just work because we provide the uh, the handshake. So that's my hope. Uh, I didn't answer your question at all there, but I hope you gave I hope I gave you some some hope for the future. Awesome. Uh, and Tim has one last question, uh, which he asked earlier, and I uh, I just missed. He's a D4 shooter, and he wants to know since the D4. So this might include some of the Z6, Z7, and all that sort of stuff. He says he asks anything new in the white balance options. Oh my God! Yes, uh, I don't think I, I think I think we have to do a separate uh, uh, stream just on that. Um, yeah, so so there's a lot of different options on on the white balance. So if we're going to talk just purely going through the white balance of the camera, um, you have your auto, which then you have your reduce the color, so keep it a little bit cooler. Then you have your keep it relatively neutral, and then you can even use it to warm it up a little bit. So this is the first option that's a little bit different. There's something similar in the D4, but it's been reworded and it's more accurate. Uh, then you have natural light auto, which this is probably one of the biggest things. If you're ever shooting, let's say sunsets, and you shoot it with, let's say your D4, if you see the crazy and deep um, pink or, or magentas in the sky or the oranges, you're not gonna see that if you keep it in auto on your D4. You're gonna get a kind of, um, it's going to be a, a, a slim down version of that. It's not going to look as punchy and as real as what you're seeing in real life. Uh, natural light auto will provide a much, much more accurate uh, white balance for when you're specifically using uh, natural light, which makes sense. Uh, and then just to be totally honest, all the capabilities of, of all of these are going to be that much more um, uh, accurate because of the new processor, because the camera is just so darn intelligent. But... Uh, we also have a better and easier way if you want to do a preset manual just on anything. So if I just held up a white screen uh, page here and I want to go and do it on my Z62, on my Z9, doesn't matter. Uh, it's really simple. You essentially go to manual preset, you hit the OK button, hold it for two seconds, and then a little yellow box pops up. Just make sure that the white paper is over that white box, hit OK, and now I have a custom white balance on specifically whatever... I'm holding or, or taking that data off of. So really, really quick to do custom white balances uh, in comparison to, to older DSLRs. Awesome. Uh, this about wraps up our time because we're closing in on the one hour mark here. Um, uh, 
when uh, when can consumers expect if they want to pre-order this camera? When is, does it start shipping? We don't know yet. Uh, they can go and obviously put their pre-orders in with Vistac right now. Uh, I know that the list is already quite long that that Vistac has, uh, as to be honest, uh, across the country. Um, but uh, we don't have an exact time frame just yet. We're still we we never. It doesn't matter the product that you go back on. If you actually look at what we say, we never give a sales start date. We always say it's going to be shipping in around this time period. And then once we get more accurate information from Japan, then we go and update it to the customers, but but to Vistec and let you guys know. So we don't know yet. We're still waiting on final numbers. Uh, all we've said is that we're going to have it by the end of 2021. Perfect. So. At the very worst, we're looking at December 31st, yeah. uh, but we're, we're hoping it comes sooner than that. Awesome. Chris, you know, my favorite game to play with you is see if Chris doesn't know something. And uh, <laughs> I like to ask questions and see if you go, I don't know, and uh, keep score. And uh, so far, uh, the scorecard is blank. Uh, you've answered all the questions. I can't trip you up. Uh, and it, and it's, it's such a great time talking to you because you're an, you're an incredible photographer, and the amount of knowledge you're able to maintain in your head uh, is somewhat dumbfounding. So thank you for your time and sharing that knowledge with us today. I hope uh, everyone watching got an opportunity to uh, ask their questions and get a better insight into this, what is clearly turning out to be an incredible product and is going to be a big, uh, big news in 2022 as people start to get this in their hands and, and start shooting with it. So uh, thank you so much, Chris. Really excited. And uh, for those watching as well, Chris did promise me that he's going to get me one, a production version when they're out that we'll get to test and play with. So uh, I look forward, very much look forward to, uh, to, to shooting with that camera. And uh, that's it for today. Thank you as always, everyone. And uh, thank you to Chris for your time. Really appreciate it. Have a good one and uh, we'll see you around.